Uh, now, I don't know if you're like me. Uh, if you're like me, then everything on Zoom is twice as hard to follow. So I picked this up from Athea. Um, I would encourage you in the next half an hour or so to go old school, which is actually have a physical Bible in front of you. Uh, it just reduces the amount of screen time you're having. And um, another good tip I picked up is to actually physically have a pen and paper in front of you and to take notes as we go through Ruth 1. But Ruth 1. I don't know if you knew this, but I used to be a farmer. Well, what kind of a farmer were you, Kevin, you might ask? That's a good question. Well, here's a picture of the product that I used to specialize in. Uh, I went to an agricultural school. Uh, and so in high school, we would have these one by one meter plots that we had to maintain. Uh, we were supposed to go during lunch times to water them, to take out the weeds. But there's a reason we don't entrust our nation's food supply to year seven and eight boys. Because why would you be responsible when you could play soccer? And so I came home with all sorts of produce to my parents, mangled carrots, multi-headed broccoli, pimple-sized potatoes. Now that all might seem a bit silly to you, but a reason, the reason I bring up farming uh, is because I wonder if that's how sometimes we think about God. That is, he might actually come into this world once in a while. He might water the plants on occasion, but by and large, he would just let the world be. And the results are mixed. And, and sometimes it might just feel like life is like mangled up carrots. And I wonder if you've ever thought to yourself, what is God doing in this world? Uh, here's an excerpt from a book I've been reading. Uh, Luke Ferry is a French secular humanist, and this is how he defines or describes philosophy. He says this, in other words, if religion can be defined as doctrines of salvation, the great philosophies can also be defined as doctrines of salvation, but without the help of a God. That is, according to him, philosophy is trying to find meaning, but not by looking externally to ourselves, but internally to our own human faculties, to reason. And I just wonder if part of us resonates with that. Because when I look around, where is God's hand in this world? And this gets amplified when we zoom in on the day-to-day -day of life. Because if God seems like that on a world scale, then what is he actually doing in my life? And it can be that there are times where we actually think to ourselves, is life actually better without God? Is it actually better with just me doing my own thing? Uh, that's the question that's posed before the characters in Ruth as we read this story. And so what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be looking at Ruth over four weeks. And it's going to be like a mini series. So think Sherlock. Each chapter is like a self-contained episode. But we're not going to get the full picture and see what happens to Moriarty until the very end. It's also a book, I dare say, that we're not very used to. Because when we read the Bible, we often see God dealing on a cosmic scale, nations, wars. But Ruth is a story that zooms in on the everyday life of one family. And it's really an immigrant story. It's really a story of leaving and returning. Uh, of things being taken away, of new hope, and of new horizons. It's a story, and it's a wonderful story, of life being in transition. And that's something you might relate to, because for so many of you, as you come from somewhere different in Canberra, you too might find yourself searching and looking for something new. And part one of this mini-series, chapter one, as you look at Ruth, starts with a scene of leaving. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at Ruth chapter one. Let's dive in. Let's immerse ourselves in the story uh, and see what God has to say to us. Now, verses one to five sets the context for us. Uh, we're reminded that this is real history, that there's names, there's places, there's a time period. This isn't Grimm's fairy tales. And so have a look, verse one, we're in the time of the judges. And there's a famine. And immediately we're introduced to a man who lives in Bethlehem in Judah. And already we're seeing that the author is setting up a tension. 
Because in the Hebrew, Bethlehem means house of bread. So there's a man from the house of bread and there's a famine. And not only that, but we're in the time of the judges. And if you understand the book of Judges, there's a pattern that happens in the book of Judges. And this slide that comes up is going to capture that in a nutshell. So if you have a look at the, the pattern, is it there? Oh, it might be missing. No, that's my work of art that I missed. Okay. Apologies. There's a pattern. Let me explain it to you. We'll take the slides off, but let me explain it to you. Uh, there's this cycle that happens in the book of Judges. So if you imagine Israel sins against God, God then judges Israel, and it's usually with a famine. Israel repents, they turn back to God. God shows grace and he delivers them, and it should be happily ever after. But what we see time and time again in the book of Judges is that Israel keeps sinning time and time again. So we have this cycle that just keeps repeating. Israel sins. God judges, Israel repents, God shows grace and deliverance, and it should be happily ever after, but Israel sins again. And it's a cycle that keeps on going and it keeps on going. So we're going to go into breakout rooms just for two minutes. And I want to ask this question to you guys. Uh, where are we in the judges cycle? Okay. If that's a cycle that we have, where are we? Uh, and secondly, what should this man in the house of bread do? Okay, you've got two minutes. Where are we in the judges cycle? And what should this man in the house of bread do? So there, we're actually in a time of judgment in the judges cycle here. And if you're an Israelite, what should you do? This man should repent. He should actually turn back to God. And so he's actually posed with the very question that we're tempted to ask, which is, in this famine, what do I do? And is life better with God? Or is life actually better without him? And I wonder what you would do. Well, this man says life is better without God. And so he leaves and he goes to the country of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Verse two, we discover this man has a name, Elimelech, which in the Hebrew means God is king. And you can feel the irony, can't you? God is king, but he leaves. We're then introduced to other characters, Naomi, his wife, the sons, Marlon and Chilean. And we've got here a picture I drew earlier that will just summarize everything beautifully. And that's going to spend, we're going to spend as much time on this as I spent drawing it. So let's move on. Um, now, when my family moved here from New Zealand, uh, my dad came beforehand for six months just to see if it would work. But as we keep reading this story and as it unfolds, we actually see that it wasn't a six month move. Verse, they took Moabite wives and in verse four, have a look, they lived for 10 years. So not only did they leave, but they laid roots. They say that if you stay in Canberra for five years, you'll end up staying for life. I'm sorry if your degree is five or six years, I guess that's what you signed up for. This move was more than five years. It was a permanent move. And the man whose name is God is king doesn't do as Israel should do. He doesn't turn back to God, but he leaves and he takes his family with him. Is life better without God? Elimelech seems to think yes. And unfortunately, the person who has to live with this man's mistakes is Naomi. Because tragedy strikes. Elimelech dies, so does his sons, Marlon and Chilean, and it feels like a whirlwind, like Game of Thrones. As soon as we're introduced to these characters, they die. And in a patriarchal society, one of the most vulnerable positions you can be is to be a widow. There was no Centrelink, no superannuation, where did you find your protection and security? It was in your marriage to a man, in, in the provision of your children in old age. It's why your parents buy granny flats in their backyard for you to stay in, so that when they're old, you're still around. And it just seems like everything is taken away from Naomi. And you just have to feel her pain. Her husband dies. 
her two sons die. I mean, children aren't meant to die before their parents. And she's like a refugee in a foreign land. And in verse 5, it seems like even her name is taken away from her. The woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Is life better without God? Elimelech might have said yes, but I doubt Naomi will feel the same. For Naomi, leaving God's land and blessing led to emptiness. For us, I wonder if it's worth thinking about this question too, whether we think life is better without God. And I wonder that for the characters in this story, it seems like having very little meant that they chose to leave God. But I actually wonder for us whether it's actually the exact opposite. It's actually having so much. Uh, There's this thing I read about called the shiny object syndrome, and some of you might relate to this. It's like an 18-month-old child who is constantly attracted to things that moves or makes a sound, but for adults. Uh, We love the new shiny idea, but we never focus or stick to any one thing. (laughs) It's making new goals, but never seeing them through. It's having new ideas, but getting nothing done. We're just constantly attracted by the new shiny thing. And I wonder if we all have shiny object syndrome when it comes to God. There's just so much wealth and opportunity that we end up thinking that there is all there is to life. Uh, I can buy a mountain bike and go on the trails every weekend if I wanted to. I can go to a cafe and get the world's best milkshake or specialty coffee. I can spend a day at the National Library and get lost in books and ideas. And in terms of the future, there's just so many opportunities for me to do the things that I love, that I find meaningful. But instead of giving thanks to God for these good things, I just wonder if they become the shiny objects that distract us from God and the realities of life and death and eternity. I joked earlier that I was a farmer. I reckon that if you talk to a real farmer, they just know how dependent on God we are for the weather. I mean, the drought we were in last year, they prayed for rain. That's what famine was supposed to do here in Ruth, to remind the Israelites of their sin and to turn back to God. And for us city folk, we've just removed from all of that. Technology and industry has provided us these circumstances by which we can think that we can find meaning without him. We think we can master this material world And we just don't, we don't feel that we're so out of our depth that we're dependent on God for these good things. And I think that's what plenty does for us. Is life better without God? I just wonder if we assume that it is. We don't even think about it. But back to Ruth, the scene shifts and we move to a season of decisions. The winds of change blows over the fields of Moab and grieving Naomi rises. Verse six, she hears that God has visited his people and given them food. And she sets out and returns to Judah. And we're at a crossroads here. Because if you were one of the daughters-in-law, what would you do? Would you follow Naomi back? but be a widow in a foreign land or hope to stay in Moab, possibly remarry and start afresh? If you're unsure of what they should do, Naomi isn't. And she makes her case in verse eight. Have a look. She says, go return. It's the word that comes up again and again. Return back to your country. Find a new husband. And we have here a farewell scene. Uh, I remember vividly the day I left New Zealand. Uh, I was seven. I didn't particularly want to come here. I didn't want to leave my friends and my family behind and start again. 
And I remember vividly the airport where our friends gathered around us to say goodbye. And just walking down the tunnel as we boarded the plane. There's weeping here. And no one wants to say goodbye. But Naomi makes a strong case. Verse 12, she's too old to have a husband again. And even if she can, she can't have a son that will grow up in time for them to marry. That is, there's very little prospects for them if they came back. And so verse 14, Orpah leaves. She kisses her mother-in-law. But Ruth, Ruth does something extraordinary. She clings to Naomi. And I think we have here in Ruth one of the most extraordinary parts of the Old Testament. And it's worth looking at what Ruth says here again, verse 16. It's up there on the slide. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Ruth throws her lot in with Yahweh, the God of Israel. She identifies with a new people. She renounces her citizenship of Moab and becomes a citizen of Israel. And her actions reflect this. She's got more faith than Naomi at this point. And she chooses to leave everything behind to follow Naomi and adopt Naomi's God as her own God. Here we have an outsider become one of God's people. And I think what we have here is an Old Testament conversion. It's what Jesus says about following him displayed in Ruth. I have here the words of Mark 8.34. And these are Jesus' words to us, or to his disciples. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels would save it. What Jesus says is that following him is giving up everything. It's losing all the shiny objects in our lives. Our loves, our passions, our ambitions and desires like Ruth, even the things that keep us safe and secure. When we follow Jesus, we lose those things and we live for him. And it's not something only some do, like the missionary who goes overseas. It's something we're all called to do. And we see it here in Ruth. Is life better without God? Ruth says no. And not knowing how it will all play out, she follows Naomi and her God. We shift then to our final scene, coming home. Naomi returns and the town stirs. You can imagine it. Uh, in a country town, you can't control the gossip at the best of times. It's, be it's been 10 years. And so verse 19, they ask, is this Naomi? Naomi, the one who left God's land and God himself is, is coming back? And in verse 20, we see the impact of grief. And we see scars in Naomi that come with loss. For Naomi is bitter. And her loss has colored everything in her experience. Verse 20, she changes her name to Mara, which in the Hebrew means bitter. And verse 21, she says this, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? I know friends who have gone through great suffering 
And I have rejoiced in how they have trusted in God more in those times of hardship and grief. Not Naomi. She's back home, but she's bitter, resentful, and she blames God for the calamity she is in. But you know what? She is back. And I think this is the big point of the chapter, that Naomi may blame God for her calamity, but God is also the one who is responsible for her return. She may be resentful and bitter, but she is back. And this chapter ends with the winds of change, for the chapter started with famine, but it ends at the beginning of the barley harvest. And there's this interesting detail that I want you to talk about now. We're just going to spend two minutes in breakout rooms, and it's the last breakout room we'll be in. But just notice in verse 22, Naomi returns, but Ruth is also said to return. So in your breakout rooms, ponder this question. What is the significance of Ruth returning? Okay, two minutes. What is the significance of Ruth returning? We'll come back and hear a few thoughts after two minutes. So here's what I was thinking, and uh, hopefully you can catch it, okay, which is Ruth's returning, right? But it's interesting because how can Ruth return when she never left? So Naomi left and came back, but Ruth was a Moabite. This is the first time she's been in Israel. So how can it be said that she is returning? And I think what we have here is a hint that Ruth is now an Israelite. That she has so identified with God uh, that Naomi's returning is said to be like Ruth returning to her God. And it's almost like she was never a foreigner in the first place. It's this hint that her very identity has changed. And we have this wonderful picture at the end of this outsider being welcomed in to God's people. Naomi may think she's empty, but as the story develops, we'll see she isn't because she's got Ruth. And Ruth will be key in moving Naomi from emptiness to fullness. But more on that in the weeks to come. But this chapter is a story of coming back of returning, of God bringing his people back to him. And some of us today may be like Naomi. Uh, you may be reluctant. You may be bitter. And it's, it might feel like you're going to the beach for the first time in spring. The sun is out, but the water is cold. And you dip your toes in, and maybe you wade in to waist height but you're not sure if you want to go further. God is calling you back home. And he invites you to have a second chance with him. Jesus says this in John 6, 37, that all that the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The good news we have in Jesus is infinitely greater than the one Naomi heard. In Jesus, we have the forgiveness of sins, such that no matter what you've done, no matter what baggage you bring, what Ruth 1 is saying is come home. Uh, when I was in uni, there was a guy in my Bible study group. He was young, enthusiastic, an avid reader of the Bible and actually theology. For my 21st birthday, he gave me this thick theological textbook that's just gathering dust on my bookshelf. I've never opened it up. But he fell in love with a young woman who didn't follow Jesus. One thing led to the next. And well, uh, what he told me was that he couldn't possibly understand how God could send anyone to hell. By that he meant he couldn't understand how God could possibly send the woman he loved to hell. And so he left God. I saw him a few years later. He was different. He had seen things in life. He had done things that he had regretted. And no doubt that there were scars that will actually stay with him for life. 
but he was back with God. He was forgiven, fully forgiven. He was full. God brought him back and will not lose him. Life is better with God. And so my hope this morning is that if you're unsure about God, that you will come back. Maybe unwilling and maybe reluctant. Like Naomi, you may have little faith, if any at all. But come back nonetheless. Know that if you come to Jesus, no matter what you've done, he will never drive you away. For God is a God of new beginnings and of second chances. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story, for how you act in the everyday of life, for your generosity and your wonderful grace that we can't even see often in the circumstances that are in front of us. And we pray that we will grasp your generosity of the forgiveness we have in Jesus, such that no matter where in life we are at the moment, no matter what bitterness we may have developed, that we will come back to you to take joy in your refuge, to have the hope that Ruth and Naomi are beginning to see here in this chapter, fully realized in Jesus. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.